Good morning. This is Maria Quatrone with Saturday's q and I'm excited today to welcome Sherry Cole from The Wardrobe, a nonprofit here in the Philadelphia metro market. And uh, Sherry is the executive director. Very, very excited to speak with you today. Sherry, welcome. Thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Yes. Well, I want to get right into it about the wardrobe. You know, when I spoke with you about a month ago, we had that Zoom. I said I was involved back in the day when it was career, women's, what was it? Women's career wardrobe. Career wardrobe. And it was. Yes, we've been through a couple of name changes. <laughs> and so that's what I knew it as. Mm -hmm. And then I found out all this great information about what you do today, which is more different than what you did back then. So I thought it would be uh, a great opportunity today to talk with everybody about the organization and what you do and how people can get involved. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, well, let's start there. Um, some of your viewers and listeners might uh, remember us as the working wardrobe. That was our what we were founded as in 1995, specifically to provide professional suits uh, to low-income women who are transitioning off of welfare and going into jobs for the first time. And then um, we sort of broadened our mission to call ourselves the career wardrobe around 2000. Um, and the goal there was to provide more than just suits for a job, but really to help women in their career journey, if you will. And we started to provide some professional development, um, you know, helping women to understand that that first job might just be exactly that, their first job, sure. their entry into the working world. But now they needed to think about step two, which is where their career and their long lasting financial independence was going to come from. And then, you know, that little thing called COVID hit um, and <laughs> what we saw um, throughout the pandemic, you know, sort of in between, we had started to provide services for men and have menswear as well. Um, and that was really precipitated by the women we were helping saying, you know, there's nothing like this for my father, brother, uncle, son, you know, what about them and where can we tell them to go? And so we started to provide menswear. And then during the pandemic, what we saw is really a need for just general clothing for people. Um, you know, we all know that the world of work as we knew it, if you're in a professional position, has really changed a lot. And that's true um, for everybody from your entry level job seekers all the way up, you know, to your lawyers and doctors and stuff, you know, we're all working differently now. And the clothing that we need to support that also has changed. Um, so we're, now we're just called the wardrobe because we broadened our mission to be generally um, eliminating clothing insecurity. You so know, before it was more yeah. business, it was women's business clothing. Right. When I was involved back in, I guess it was the 90s. Right. Because I brought suits that either I grew out of or grew into. No, I don't have. They didn't fit either way. Didn't matter. Didn't matter. <laughs> no judgment. A lot of suits. A lot of suits went over suits. there. Piles. <laughs> Piles of suits. <laughs> but now it's clothes for everybody. Right. So really anything, you know, I often hear from our clothing donors, you know, this is the wardrobe pile and this is like the Goodwill Salvation Army pile. Um, and I'm going to bring you this, you know, professional stuff. What, um, if nothing else, if people will remember after our conversation today that we have a desperate need for menswear. So if you have men in your life or folks who, who have men's style clothing, please clean out their closets for us as well. And we need casual as well as professional wear. Um, we're seeing a large increase in people who are coming to us as their first stop after they leave jail. Um, so who are coming back into our society after serving their debt. Um, and they need everything. Um, we also see a lot of people who are coming through domestic violence situations, you know, who might have experienced homelessness, who just need, you know, now they have a place to go 
um, but they need clothes to fill their entire closet. And that's sort of what we mean when we say we're helping to eliminate clothing insecurity is, you know, what is it that you need to fill your closet that's going to make you feel, you know, quote unquote, normal again, that's going to, mm -hmm. you know, support your independence and whatever your next step in life is. Well, clothing is an important thing, not just because you need to wear it, but mm -hmm. the way that it affects uh, your psychology. I know when I put something on that's really nice, right? I feel beautiful. Feel different. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then when I'm wearing like rippity clothes, which I really don't, but let's just say, you know, like more, you know, you want to leave the house clothes. Right. As I would say. It does. It's a different um, mojo. It's a, a different feeling. And I guess it's there's a lack of awareness around how many people actually need clothes. I it's, think that, yeah. Yeah. Like I mean, a, a lot of the people we help will have no idea what their size is. And you think, how can that be? Like, we, we all have a general sense of, you know, when we're going into a department store or even Target, you know, I'm going to go to this end of the rack or that end of the rack, right? Um, imagine not having had the resources to go to a store, you know, and and find something that fits you and try it on. We're not being welcomed in that environment too, you know. Um, we serve a lot of people who are experiencing homelessness and, you know, in their surveys at the end of their appointment, you know, they say things like, you know, I was treated like a person for the first time, you know. It's, wow. You know, it's it's what we call our star treatment, you know, styling time, advice and respect. Everybody who comes through our doors, no matter what their situation is, is greeted with that um, because we're all human. We all have a need. Um, and the need that we can provide for them is not only the clothing, but the dignity that comes from knowing you have something to pick out of your closet that's going to make you feel like yourself, whatever that might be. It's interesting that you just said that people don't know their size. Yeah. I find I'm, I'm curious about that. Right. right. How, how's that possible? Because it's been so long since they've worn, been, like, worn like purchasing thing on their own or gone into a store on their own. You know, um, if you think about um, it, it's, it's most stark to, to me when I'm helping somebody who's come out of incarceration. So um, there was a study done several years ago that men tend to lose weight in prison because they're really, you know, encouraged to work out and like have exercise as something that they do all the time, right? And then women tend to gain weight in prison um, because they're they're just not encouraged to do that. They're encouraged to be more sedentary, um, and you know, the food there isn't the best, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so when we're working with somebody who's come out of prison, they might be, well, I was, you know. A medium when I went in, but you know, I've been wearing essentially a jumpsuit, a jumpsuit. scrubs, you know, that somebody handed me. Like there's been no size to. Um, and similar if somebody's been experiencing prolonged homelessness as well, you know, they might just be, you know, given the t-shirt and that's the t-shirt they're gonna wear, like whether or not it fits well. So <laughs> having that styling appointment where you get to come in. And, um, you know, our stores, first of all, they look like stores. Um, they are stores, they're functioning resale stores. So you and I can come in and shop alongside somebody who's getting the exact same inventory for free um, because they qualify for our services. Um, and they are a high-end boutique, you know, everything is well merchandised and you, you know, get to pick what you want to try on. if. It takes you an hour to try on, you know, five different sizes and outfits until you find the one that looks great. Awesome. We're going to help you to do that. You know, no, no judgment. And that, you know, with that level of customer service, I, I encourage people 
to think about, you know, if you've ever had the opportunity to go to a high-end department store, a Neiman Marcus, a Nordstrom, a, you know, someplace where people are really paying attention to you and what you need, that's the level of service that people get at the wardrobe, no matter where why they come to us. Wow. How special is that? It really is. It's it's very empowering. Um, you know, I don't use the word empower lightly, you know, because everything has to start with meeting somebody where they are yeah. um, and, you know, getting them then what they need. Um, and clothing, I often think of is, you know, it's very essential, but it's also the hook to what often will help people move to the next stage, you know, of their life. Like the number of people who have come out of a dressing room and, well, my favorite um, sort of recent exclamation from a client was he came out of the dressing room, looked at himself and said, I feel like Clark Kent turned into Superman. Uh. <laughs> you know, like, I can I wear this outfit home because I want my kids to see me in it? You know, like uh, the number of case managers when somebody has come back to the program that sent them and said, I literally didn't recognize this person because she looked so different and carried herself so differently in her new clothes from the wardrobe. Like that's just a special thing that I think often, you know, we can take for granted. A hundred percent. And you can't put a price tag on that. No, no. And we don't, which is very important. Yeah, and you, and you know, right. I would imagine that it's very difficult to get a job to get or start a career uh, re-entering you know, the workforce with not the proper clothing, even to go to an interview. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, anybody who's who's listening or watching who has, um, you know, hires people for entry level positions. Um, my my nephew started out um, in the McDonald's um, was a McDonald's, you know, worker when he was in high school and stayed with it and now has just been offered his first store as a GM. And I think I talked to him a lot about like what he's looking for when people come in um, and apply for jobs. And you think, oh, a job at McDonald's, anyone can do that. Well, anyone can't do that. You have to be able to, you know, take direction and work with people and be okay working with people. But on top of that, you need to present yourself in such a way that someone's going to take a chance on you, knowing very little about you, right? And so even if you're walking in to pick up a job application at a place like McDonald's, you know, going in, if you're a man with a collared shirt and tie and khaki pants, makes all the difference on how somebody is going to perceive you. You know, that like five second rule that you make your judgment about somebody within the first five to three seconds of meeting them. It's is so true. true. It's so true. Yeah. I've, been, I've interviewed so many people. We have a scholarship program and I just literally, if they weren't dressed appropriately to come into an office for an interview, they were checked off the list right. no matter what they said. But you would, I don't know that you would be surprised. Many people might be surprised by the way people come in. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, not sure if they're not, they don't have somebody to tell them that they shouldn't wear jeans yeah. with holes in it and yeah. a shirt. Yeah. I mean, we that's that. part of it. Yeah. That, that's definitely part of it. If you think about, you know, we work with a lot of families and people who we're talking about intergenerational poverty, right? Like yeah. folks who, you know, whose mom or dad might have been in the criminal justice system, might have, you know, lived themselves in poverty, never had, quote unquote, office job, a professional job. How, like thinking back on it, I use this story a lot too. How did you first learn what was appropriate um, to wear and to act in, in a, an environment? Um, I had the good fortune of having parents who were professionals. Um, neither of them went to college. I was the first person in my, you know, entire family to go to college. But, you know, they didn't have that experience to give to me. 
but I used to work summers, you know, answering the phones at the office that my mom ran. Um, and I had this clear memory of like 10 year old Sherry thinking it would be really funny if I answered the phone by whistling instead of saying hello. Like that was going to be awesome. That was going to be a lot of fun for me. Sure that and, went over well. and I did it. And I have never heard my father yell as much as he did <laughs> the time I did that. And I learned, oh, I guess why isn't it okay to answer the phone whistling? Whistling's fun. Who doesn't like whistling? You know, um, but like those, that's a story I come back to because it's like, oh, that's how I learned to, to say, oh yeah, you have to say hello. Like that's how you properly answer a phone. Like kids don't grow up knowing these things. And so, yeah, they see what their peers wear and get away with. Maybe their teachers wear and get away with. And those are the styles of the day. And there's been no one to really tell them, no, this is this is what you want to wear when you want to present yourself in a different way. Um, I, I often, think it's, no, go ahead. No, I often think of it as the uniform you need to get a job. Exactly. The uniform you need to get that scholarship. So it's not what you're going to wear every day. Um, but it's what you're going to wear when, like, I have outfits even in my closet that, like, will sit there, you know, 11 months out of the year, and I'll wear once because they're my special, you know, I'm meeting with somebody who wants to, you know, support us and give us money. This is the outfit, I'm going to wear, you know, like, but when I'm just going in to work with my team and everything, I'm probably wearing leggings and a sweater, you know, like, there, we, we know how to, I often think of it too as code switch, you know, like you have your professional you, you have your, you know, going out to a concert you, you have your dinner with friends you, you know, we all have different hats that we wear, different outfits that we wear that make us feel differently. And, you know, that's something that we're able to teach, especially young people that you know it's okay to have a different face if you will or a different outfit that makes you you know feel and appear different to the world that's part of how you're going to get ahead i think starting out in the beginning the whole idea of a uniform yeah. is a great idea we talk about it at the office all the time uh, especially with training uh, new agents have certain things that you're going to wear you know especially younger people mm -hmm. at five outfits one, one a day, Monday to Friday, and don't have to think about it. Don't have to, you know, these are like young, young people, right? So even myself, I have like a standard type of clothing that I wear. Actually, I think all my clothing is the same now. <laughs> <laughs> I go from yeah, night to day. In real, in real estate, it's like, um, it's an interesting career because you're always in real estate. Like I'm in real estate all the time. It does never, ever stop, mm -hmm. you know, and you have to like intertwine it in your life. Unfortunately for me, it's what has become my life a lot, <laughs> trying to be able to intertwine things more again. But I, I like to have certain things and uh, to wear and I don't have to think about it because it's one less thing that I have to make a decision about. Oh, yeah. There, there was an interview back during Obama's administration where somebody asked him, tan suit aside, um, you know, why he always wore, I think he always wore like blue and gray or something like that. And his answer was, he could only have things hanging in his closet that he knew went with one another, because that was one less decision he had to make. Absolutely. You know, and when you are somebody who makes a lot of decisions, a lot of important decisions, you know, hemming and hawing over what matches in your you know, wardrobe is not one of those things. You know, I also wanted to mention when people come to the wardrobe, they get six pieces of clothing plus accessories and shoes. And that's so we can help them create what we call a capsule wardrobe in fashion. So you have six pieces that intermix with one another and mix and match with one another. So you have a couple professional top pieces some bottoms and then maybe like a dress or a sweater or a blouse 
so that with those six pieces, um, we have a great graphic that our wardrobe box manager put together to show like sort of how many outfits those six pieces can make. And I think it's something like 18 or 20 outfits just with like those six pieces. So that's part of also what we're teaching folks is that, you know, folks can come to us four times a year, um, meant to be each season and get a capsule wardrobe for each season. And that should really set them up um, for the clothing that they need, you know, to get them into that next season. Um, so it, it's a lot that we're providing them, um, you know, the styling, the advice, plus the physical clothing. That's super cool. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of, that's a lot of outfits. It is. It's, it's amazing. Um, I like, I am not the fashionista on staff. So, <laughs> um, but when they told me, you know, these, these six pieces, we, we actually did a training for staff. Um, where everybody had to pick six outfit or six pieces and then figure out how many outfits they could make. And I was just amazed because I'm your basic black, gray, you know, like very little color in my wardrobe because I know they'll all go together um, kind of person. But they were picking these wild prints and I was like, no, there's no way you're going to make that work. And, you know, darn if they didn't. <laughs> That's... That's great. That's a great tool to, to be able to do and take that small amount of clothing and actually make it into 18 things. I don't know that I could do that, um, but I digress. We won't right. talk about it. We won't talk <laughs> that, about it. That'll be something else. Well, you know, that'll be another conversation. Yeah. So tell me um, what the wardrobe, I know the wardrobe is lacking in men's clothing, mm -hmm. all men's clothing. Right. Um, and and, and you have, there are how many locations now? Five? Five? Uh, yeah, we have, I have to count them in my head. Uh, six, actually. Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. which, does any one particular location need more than other? Or do you have a hub? Right. Philadelphia really acts as our hub. It's our largest location um, and has the most storage. So really, we, we take most of our inventory in Philadelphia. Um, Delaware County, uh, we're in Upper Darby uh, and Lansdowne. We're sort of on the dividing line there. And then in Chester County, we have a site in Exton and Kennett Square um, under the name Wings for Success. They're our partner in Chester County. Um, so those are the four donations where we, or places where we accept donations. You can find them all on our website, wardropa.org. Um, and so, any inventory or any donations that come into those sites get sorted for what we need as a whole. And then we're able to kind of move it to the location. Like if, but generally all of our locations need the same type of clothing. Um, so we, we do some transporting around, um, but not really as much as you might imagine. Um, yeah, and then anything that we can't use, we work with a recycling partner um, who ethically recycles it. So either, you know, if it really has no usable value anymore, um, think of your used socks, you know, <laughs> other things that find their way into the donation bag that maybe you didn't expect to be in that donation bag, but it ended up there anyway, um, are turned into rags. But then other things are bundled together and sold to resellers or other thrift stores who can use them. Um, and so that partner, um, so know that anything that you donate to us is not going to end up in the trash. Even if we can't use it, we are passing it on to somebody else who can. That's excellent. You know, I was just thinking while we we're talking, I would love to do a clothing drive uh, for the wardrobe and perhaps like the early spring, maybe like March, when we can be a donation site to collect them and then bring them all over to you. Oh, we would love that. Yeah, we, we have a whole um, package that we can send over to anybody who would like to run a drive. You know, if you have even one site, but if you have multiple sites, if you have the public coming in, you know, we can give you some signage and some bins that you can collect things in. Um, you know, the, the one issue that we have um, is that we don't offer a pickup service um, because we don't we have, have We have trucks. <laughs> Yay, truck. We, we, we're kindly drop it off. No problem. <laughs> you know, we just did a, a drive toys for tots. Uh -huh. And, 
you know, we sent it out through marketing and everything. So some people came by who saw that, but a lot of the donations that we got were from neighbors because we had the sign in the window and the right. box there mm -hmm. and tons of people just came in and dropped the toy and they saw it, saw a sign. That's it awesome. Great. Yeah. Well, I, I sometimes think of that I can spend my entire day just responding to Facebook posts about what do I do with my clothes? I have clothes, where do I take them? And you know, I can just like cut and paste the wardrobe information in everyone. So I think, you know, any place where we can get the word out that like if you have extra clothes, especially if it's convenient for people, it's in people's neighborhoods, you know, I, you know. Convenience is everything because is. I have had before clothing and then you have to take it to uh some place and they're only open at this time and i don't yeah. remember what happened with it but oh then they were supposed to pick it up and nobody picked it up and anyway yeah, I, yeah. I do think like if you're it's really hard for for charities especially if they're smaller to yeah, really no doubt. have that um so, so so we try and make it very easy um our sites are open monday through saturday 11 to 6 and you can literally bring your donations in anytime we're open um you know we even have our tax receipt online um so after you even before you drop them off you can fill out the tax receipt if you need that um and yeah we try and make it really easy you know the only thing we can't offer is you know pick up close to our locations our recycling partner helps you though if people are watching this in Montgomery County and some of the areas in Chester County, um, Bucks County, they will pick up um, for recycling. Um, and we have that link on our website. So if it's you know really too far for people to get into Philadelphia or one of our other locations, um, they can have their items picked up. The clothing won't come to us, but we do, you know, earn income, which is the other piece of what we need from people is financial support from those donations um, that are picked up by our recycler. Right. It's not 100 percent free and you do get grants, but yes. it doesn't cover everything. No. Did that come through yet? Yes. Um, so what our largest funder is the state of Pennsylvania, the Department of Human Services. We have a grant for returning citizens and also those who are on welfare assistance um, that was held up by the delay in the fiscal code passage, but they did pass that two weeks ago when they were in session. Wow. So that has um, been, um, we, we still don't have any funding coming in through it. So, you know, we're still waiting, um, but that grant will be offered to us again this year. So that was very exciting. That was a very harrowing few months. I'm sure, I'm yeah. sure. That's yeah. great news, Sherry. Yes. Yes, it, it was a good Christmas present for us. We were very happy. Yeah, I think that having uh, this in discussion with you today is at a perfect time with Christmas Eve tomorrow, Christmas Day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been, I've, I got an email from a colleague who works at a bank and it was wishing, you know, happy holiday, something he's sent out to everybody. Mm -hmm. But, it really brought things into perspective of how fortunate, you know, if you have a home and you have some money in a bank and some money in your wallet um, and you have, you know, pretty good health and just broke all these things down. And it, it really gives perspective of how much, you know, we really do have. And I believe as uh, being a good human that we should be at all in contribution and giving back you know, as much as we can. Um, that's all part of it. So I'm very happy to um, offer up doing this drive. I think it will be great. I think we'll get some neighborhood people. It'll give my husband and I too, selfishly, a chance <laughs> to get rid of all of our stuff that either, you know, we are tired of or doesn't fit anymore. Right. Um, I go in my closet and I'm like, oh God, this has to get... <laughs> I know, I know. Well, you deal with people who move all, are, are moving and we I'm moved moving. a few years ago, I was explaining to you. And I think I, you know, I lived for two months on a small garment bag worth of clothes. And I was like, this is obviously all I need. Like, I really don't need, you know, the two closets full of clothes that I have. No, <laughs> no we don't. 
No. I think part of it is something about getting rid of things. It's more psychological. You mm -hmm. know, it's not like we're lazy and we can't pack up stuff in a box or a bag. It's yeah. holding on to that for some reason. Um, a moment in time, young, you know, your younger years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're very attached to our clothes. You know, we often will hear from people when they drop them off, you know, they want to tell us the story of their clothes, which is great. You know, they've, they've really taken care and everything to it. We, we had a donor once who was like, she had everything together, like, and pinned to it were little baggies with like, these are the earrings I wear with this suit. And here is the thing, <laughs> oh, wow. you know, very particular. And I felt and so bad knowing that we were just gonna pull it all apart, you know, um, that that whole outfit was not going to a person like um, as she wanted it, but it was great care that she took in giving that to us. Wow. Yeah, yeah you we do get attached to, uh not just people, but things too, yeah, right? right. Yeah. Uh, I think that this was um, perfect timing today for this, Sherry. Uh, thank you for giving us the awareness about the wardrobe. And I'm sure that uh, we'll get some more clothes for you. And also shoes. You take yes. Okay. Shoes, accessories, outerwear. Um, you know, we're in winter season, so we like to give everyone coats gloves, hats, scarves. I don't know about you, but I have more hats and scarves. I don't know where they come from. Um, yes. but yeah, yeah, gifts, exactly. Going through that, you know, somebody gives you um, a scarf this Christmas season and that you don't need it and doesn't match your coat, just pass it on onto on us. We won't tell them at all. That it was it's okay. It'll go to a good home. Yeah, which is most important. Right. Well, Sherry, happy holidays to you and your family. Thank you so much for coming on today and um, sharing about the wardrobe. And I'm sure we will see you. We'll have you on again uh, soon, sometime next year, to touch base on how we did after this wardrobe drive. And we'll I talk about that. Yeah. And we'll talk about that more in a few weeks. Wonderful. Thanks All so right. much. Thank you. Have a great one. All right. Bye bye.